7. Uh, in your book, we start on page 313. And you can see the topic here is allocation of cost to support departments, and we'll talk about what a joint product is also. So the objectives, uh, we'll talk about a support department versus a producing department. Uh, we'll talk about charging rates between departments. Uh, we'll talk about allocating support center cost to production departments. There's a few different methods to do that, direct and sequential and reciprocal. We'll also talk about departmental overhead rates and then what joint products are and how to allocate joint cost to joint products. Um, so just to kind of beginning on page 313, um, just know then that overview cost allocation, um, common costs are typically mutually beneficial costs occur when some the same resource is used um, in the output of two or more services or products. Uh, it may pertain to periods of time, individual responsibilities, so just like people, the sales territory, or to classes of customers. So again, um, it's all about how do we capture these costs, measure them, allocate them, and so on. So a means of dividing a pool of cost, and um, you know I've had different books where we talk about a cost bucket, a cost pool, it means the same thing. Uh, when I was in industry, and uh, we were allocating costs um, in a service company, we always talked about cost buckets. So just be aware of that. Um, but we're not affecting total cost, it's just how we're classifying costs. And then amount of cost assigned to subunits um, is affected by allocation procedure chosen. So we're going to accumulate costs based on something into different pools or buckets. Um, that does not affect total cost, it's just a way to capture the, the cost and measure them by something. And then we'll allocate those costs to a subunit which could be anything. It could be a department, a person, a region, a product, a service, you name it. Um, so just to overview then, there's two types of departments uh, in companies, producing and supporting. Uh, those terms are in your book, just right on page 313. So a producing department is directly responsible, create that is actually creating a product or a service that's then sold to a customer. A support department uh, provides essential services for production departments. So supporting the production by servicing a department more or less. So the first step in cost allocation is to determine what the cost objects are. Uh, typically that would be maybe a department. Um, so just some examples then for a furniture maker and the same information is in your book. It's on page 516. Uh, so we have producing departments where we have some assembly, supervisor salaries, small tools, indirect materials, depreciation of machinery, uh, finishing, sandpaper, depreciation. So that's you know basically all the, just think of the departments that are making uh, the furniture, and those are the producing departments, and think of the support, okay? So material storeroom, cafeteria, maintenance, general factory, okay? The things that need to happen to support the production of the furniture. Then the same thing for a bank, also on page uh, um, 312. It's on page 314. Um, so in the bank, um, we've got auto loans, commercial lending, personal bank, and kind of the big three categories. To support those big three, we have a drive through, uh, data processing bank administration in the various subcategories beneath those. So top of page 315 is this information, um, basically the steps in allocating support department cost to producing departments. Okay, so departmentalize the firm, right? Many companies have departments. Each department is doing a specific thing. Makes common sense. I would guess the vast majority of you work at a company that has various departments. Classify each department as support or producing. Trace all overhead in the firm to either support or producing. Allocate support department costs to producing department costs. Okay, so basically, just remember, it goes from support to producing. Calculate the predetermined overhead rate for producing, and then allocate overhead costs um, from producing then to your individual products. So basically, 
you're allocating costs to service departments first, then service to produ production, then production to units. So um, how do we allocate costs to support departments? Um, there's lots of ways to do it, of course. And it's, you're looking for some what they call causality, causal factors. Uh, they mention that term on the bottom of page 315. And so um, what you see here then is also on page 316 of your book. Um, you can just see for depending on what kind of department it is, um, there's something that we should be able to measure that we can use as a activity driver. So accounting number of transactions, cafeteria number of employees, and so on. You can see what the different uh, possibilities are there. Um, so what is the objective of allocation? Also on page 316, uh, obtain a mutually agreeable price, compute product line profitability, predict economic effects of planning control, value inventory, motivate managers. So it's kind of a way, think of it from this perspective, there's a cost to having a support department. And if we can figure out what those costs are, and obviously each department is going to have somebody in charge, that department, a manager, or some, somebody, and if we can give them um, numbers to motivate them some way or just to measure efficiencies and then use that as motivation rewards and so on um, we can find some efficiencies in the business and try to run as you know the best way we possibly can so really just think of it as allocating cost from one department to another okay and it says um, typically that happens through some kind of a charging rate two major factors determine that rate. Is it going to be a single or dual charge rate? We'll talk more about that. And the use of budgeted or actual support departmental costs. So single charge rate. And this single charge rate is begins on page 318. And um, as usual, just so you know in the chapter, there's various cornerstones. Um, the first one is on page 319, cornerstone 7-1 or 7.1. They're always kind of in a purplish color, so they, they stand out. Um, that's going to walk you through how to calculate a single charge rate also. Just just go through those. I, I Every week I'm going to stress how important those are to go through on your own. Uh, but you can see here the formula for the single charge rate. It says similar concept to a plant-wide uh, overhead rate, kind of the same thing. Um, and so it's fixed cost plus variable cost divided by usage. So remember it says here estimated, right? So we're guessing it's got that predetermined rate. I'm estimating what I believe my total variable cost will be and what my total estimated usage will be. Or we can go to multiple charge rates and just kind of think of that then more like having a departmental rate for a business. And multiple charge rates is on page 320. Uh, cornerstone 7.2 is on page 321, where they walk you through uh, a little bit more information on how to do those. It says that a single charging rate may mask causal factors that lead to support department's total costs. And so dual rates with the fixed component and variable component would be obviously more accurate. It's just a matter of... Um, you know, time and effect. Um, obviously, when we get into the mul multiple rates, they're going to be more complicated to keep track of and to prepare. So multiple charging rates, the allocation of fixed costs follows a three-step procedure. Uh, determine budgeted fixed support service costs, compute computation of the allocation ratio, and you can see here production department capacity divided by total capacity, and allocation is the ratio times budget fixed support costs. Okay, that's one part of it. Then we have our budgeted versus actual usage. Uh, by allocating budgeted costs instead of actual costs of a support department to production, no inefficiency efficiency are transferred from one department to another. For product costing, allocation is done at the beginning of the year on the basis of budgeted usage, so we can have that predetermined rate. Okay, that's usually the best way. As the causal factors can differ for fixed and variable cost, these types of costs should be allocated separately, right? So 
they're going to have different causalities that will cause them to be um, incurred. So again, um, it's one thing for me to say it. It's better that you read through it and then look at the example on page 321. That would be much more effective, I think, with this one. Uh, the solution for it is on page 322 for Cornerstone 7.2. Um, and then page 323 starts to begin the discussion of budgeted versus actual usage and can just a few bullet points I just mentioned to you previously. And then on page 324 is information that's on your screen. And you can show or see here the single rate method in the top, top part of this, the dual rate method at the bottom, and um, you can just see um, how allocated costs, we're still allocating cost in total the same, just a little bit of rounding here that we're off a dollar, no big deal. But you can see here that the dollars assigned to three different departments, audit, tax, and MAS, um, based on copies, if we just go with a single rate, just say 12 cents a copy, here's your cost, um, that's one way to do it. Another way that's probably more efficient, or more accurate, I should say, would be the same number of copies. The rate's now very different. We have a variable rate, but we also have a fixed allocation. Okay, so there's a fixed piece and a variable piece. And the fixed piece isn't really going to change much. The variable piece will be rate will be completely dependent on the number of copies. So you can see here uh, what my costs turn out to be. And you can just see that for different um, number of copies in this screen than we had in the previous screen. Okay, so um, page, in that previous screen, I should say, was on page 325, the use of actual data. Um, exhibit 7.4 is budgeted, and then the uh, Exhibit 7.5 is actual. Okay, so now um, let's start talking about the data for support and producing departments. You can see on this screen, which the same information is on the bottom of page uh, 326, is I've got two support departments and I have two producing departments. My support departments are power and maintenance. My producing departments are grinding and assembly. They'll have direct costs, which we can directly assign to those departments. Um, you know, basically, uh, fit, um, their labor and other things that we know direct, just, this cost is completely incurred by this department. And then we have activity, and you can see we um, have activity measured in kilowatt hours and maintenance hours. Okay. So we have different ways to allocate depart support department cost to production department cost. The first one is the direct method. This begins on page 327. It says all costs of the support departments are allocated directly to producing in proportion to each producing department's usage of the service. It does not allocate any support department cost to another support department, even if other support departments use the service. Okay, so basically going back to the data then, what that means is we go directly from support to production. Okay. In reality, it's very possible that maintenance uses some power, right? Or that power uses some maintenance. So you could make the argument that we should be charging to each other in the support departments first before allocating to production. You can make that argument. In the direct method, though, we're not going to do that. We're just going to go directly from support to production. Okay. So this information, again, page 327. So I've got my two support departments, and it says suppose there are two support departments right here, and each with a bucket of directly traceable costs. So just think of each as a bucket. Distribute all the power maintenance costs to grinding and assembly using the direct method. So all their costs must go to grinding and assembly. And so we have the arrows. Power is going to get allocated to grinding and assembly. Maintenance will get allocated to grinding and assembly. 
after allocation, zero cost is in power and maintenance. All the costs are allocated to grading and assembly. Nothing is left over in the support departments. Okay, that was the direct method, the easiest one for sure. Next is sequential. And also, before I get into sequential, just know that, as usual, there's a cornerstone when we get to one of these things. And cornerstone 7-3 is on page 325, I'm sorry, 328, and then we'll walk you through an example. So now sequential is on page 329, and sequential um, there's a good picture of it then on page 330 that we'll get into here next. So sequential recognizes the fact that support departments have interactions and support each other. It takes only partial account of this interaction, and they call it a step-down fashion following a predetermined ranking schedule. Okay. So we are acknowledging that there is some support, that the support departments depend on each other. So same information, same departments, everything as before. Only now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to rank the support departments. We're going to rank power as number one, maintenance as number two. Okay. So you have to do this, and we'd probably rank power first because they probably they had um, the bigger cost, I believe, if I remember right. And I should look back at the book here. And uh, power had. Um, 250,000 worth of direct costs. That's probably why they were chosen first. Maintenance is only 160. But it's really up to the company. There's no right or wrong to it. But we're going to say power is number one. And now we're going to take power and allocate it not just to grinding and assembly, but to maintenance grinding and assembly. So notice that. Now we're allocating power to another support department. So now power has no cost in it, but maintenance does have cost, right? So maintenance has cost uh, that it had directly from itself plus that it received from power. So now maintenance has to allocate its cost to grinding and assemblies. That's what they mean by step down. Step one, step two, and if you had 30 support departments, you just have the various steps. Okay, so then after the allocation, uh, power maintenance have zero cost and everything has been allocated to grinding and to assembly. So the sequential method then does recognize those interactions. Uses The usage of one support department by another is used to determine total cost of each support department. Okay. And as usual, there's a cornerstone where you follow an example. Cornerstone 7-4 on page 351 walks you through a very good sequential method. Okay, um, So total cost of a support department is total cost equals direct cost, which we can we know directly are incurred by the department, plus allocated costs that are coming from other departments. Okay. Um, there's also another method called reciprocal. Reciprocal is in your book on page um, 333. Um, just be aware of it. Um, I'm not so concerned that you know how to do this one. I'm not going to. Uh, there's nothing in Cengage now where you will be doing the reciprocal um, method. Um, just be aware of it. It's it's the best method, let's put it that way, it's going to be the most accurate. Um, however, it's also the most challenging to do. I'm just more concerned that you can do a direct and a sequential, and I'm good to go. Uh, reciprocal, again, is going to basically, just think of reciprocal, the support departments are going to allocate to each other first, and then we'll allocate to the uh, production departments. But it's much more challenging to do much more math, um, algebraic related. I'm not so concerned we know how to do that in this class. I want you to be aware of it, but then really know how to do uh, direct and sequential. Those will be in Cengage now. Uh, the comparison is on page 335, which is on the screen that you see right now, towards the bottom of that page. Um, it's safe to say that reciprocal is the most accurate, direct is the least accurate, 
and sequential somewhere in between. And you can see there's different answers uh, for each one. Okay, but definitely you would say reciprocal is the most accurate. Now, in reality, are, is this close enough? Does close count between the three? Probably. Um, it's really up to that company to decide that um, how accurate they want to get. Um, but you can probably make the argument that close counts, and this is a pretty good start if we just go with either, either direct or sequential. Okay, so next then is a discussion of departmental um, overhead rates and product, product costing. Um, you can see here it says after allocating all support service costs to production departments, an overhead rate is calculated by department, so instead of having a plant-wide rate, we're going back to the departmental rate concept we've talked about in previous chapters. And so that includes allocated costs from the service departments, plus that producing department's overhead cost that we know directly can be traced to that producing department, divided by whatever our measure of activity is, typically something involving direct labor hours or machine hours. The accuracy of product costs then depends on the accuracy of assignment of overhead costs. We all know that. Um, and then they want the kind of the final um, cornerstone involving this topic is 7.6. That's on pages 336 and 337. It's not a big one, uh, but walk through that and they'll kind of just give you a feel for kind of just the culmination of the allocation between departments. Okay, new topic now on page 339 is the discussion of joint costs and joint production processes. And just think of a joint cost as when you have one raw material and at some point in the manufacturing process that one raw material can be split off into more than one product, multiple products. So the split off point is the point at which joint products become separable and identifiable. Okay, So I can now say I've got two or more different products that are separable and identifiable. Um, joint or main product products have relatively significant sales value. So you could have what they call a byproduct that has a small sales value. You have multiple joint products that have very significant sales values. So a good picture of it is right here. Um, this is on page 339, right at the top of the page. And so we're talking about butchering a hog. Um, we've got the processing of it, and at some point we have pork meat of various cuts. And then we have the pork hide, which you know both have value. Um, cost separability and the need for allocation. So the, the issue is that we've got this processing cost that was happening right here in the middle, the green processing cost. How much of that processing cost is allocated to pork meat? How much is allocated to hides? That is one of the questions. So separable costs are easily traced to individual products and offer no particular problem. So obviously, once we have pork meat, there's a cost uh, with that. Once we have pork hide, there's a cost with that. We know what those are. We can directly say cost is either one. Um, but the processing is the challenge. Okay, so cost allocations are arbitrary. Um, hopefully, you know, they say that. Hopefully, you've realized that by now. We've been talking a lot about allocations over the weeks, and they are very, very arbitrary. Um, so another example um, is steel, and it says here at the bottom. This is on the bottom of three thirty-nine. So I've got material of steel. Um, I do my processing, and I turn that steel into either a Ford Mustang or a Ford Taurus. I'm not even sure they make the Taurus anymore, but uh, they, they use the example for Ford in the book, for Ford Motor Company. So page 339, they discuss that. Okay, so accounting for joint product costs. So joint costs must be allocated to the individual products for purposes of financial reporting. Several methods have been developed to do this. Um, you can see what those are. We'll talk about most of them. So let's go through each one. Uh, physical units is on the bottom of page 340, and uh, there is also a cornerstone on page 341, cornerstone 77, that will walk you through how to do it. And none of these are that difficult. 
just, I mean, they really are fairly straightforward. So just go through it. And I, I'm certain that everybody will look at that example and go, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, so we're, it says joint costs are distributed on the basis of physical measure. Um, how many pounds? I mean, it, you know, whatever the product is we're making, we can measure it. Pounds, tons, gallons, board feet, atomic weight, heated units. The example in the cornerstone is board feet. Weighted average is uses some kind of a weight factor. Um, time, size of unit, materials used to distribute. And they do a weighted average example on um, cornerstone 7-8 on page 343. Sales value split off method. Uh, basically allocate those joint costs based on uh, the market value or sales value of the joint products at split up point. What would they be worth if we sold them? And we can use that ratio then to allocate costs. So obviously the higher market value goods will receive the vast majority of the joint cost and a lower value good would not receive much uh, joint cost at all. And sales value split off is on page 340. Five, cornerstone 7-9 and again you can look at that one and again none of these are that difficult you'll look at each one of these and go okay yeah that makes sense they're just they're very straightforward um, those are the big three that um, most businesses use there's a few other ones that they're going to show us that are uh, and again constant gross margin some of these other ones here I'm not so concerned that you're aware that you know how to do the ones that I think you the ones you definitely need to know how to do were the first three, um, the the uh, weighted average, the physical units, and the sales value. Those are the big three, but there's other methods that that have uh, come along too. So um, constant gross margin percent you can see right here uh, recognizes that costs incurred to split off are part of the cost of the total, which profits are expected to be earned. So it allocates costs such that gross margin percent is the same for each product. So um, just be aware of it. I, you don't have to actually calculate it. Now do know that you can also have um, byproducts. And it says a secondary product recovered in the course of manufacturing a primary product uh, obtained from joint production processes that have relatively little sales value. And there's two ways to account for them. Um, you can credit byproduct revenue to other income or sale of byproduct in your income statement, or you can reduce joint costs to the main products by the amount of product revenue. So it's either call it revenue itself, or just take that revenue and subtract it from the cost of producing your main product. Either way, it gets you to the same net income number on your income statement. Just be aware of that. And that is, and they talk about the byproducts um, on page 350. I don't have any Cengage now byproduct uh, things you have to work on. So it's more, again, just to be aware of the concept. You don't have to crunch the numbers based on byproducts. Just be aware of the concept. I will ask a question or two on the concept of it, but there's no number crunching. Okay, that was Chapter 7 as usual. Um, you know, look through all the cornerstones. They're very useful. Um, when you get done with the chapter, be aware of the key terms. They're on page 354. You want to have a you know, fairly good idea of what those are before you take the quiz. And then um, the discussion questions are on page uh, 358. I've always had the answers for those posted in the handout section of the class. And uh, just go through those questions and uh, make sure that you know, as you read the question, just think in your brain what the answer is. Look at the answer sheet. And just see how close you got and just you know that will kind of help you understand if you understand the concept or not and if you don't just you know read about it more in the chapter or look at the PowerPoint and uh, you'll learn it very quickly